You've made it this far unscathed, and now all that stands between you and victory is the greatest challenge of the entire run. There's simply no getting around the fact that this boss boasts the most complex and varied moveset in the game, nor that he can be quick and hard to read, nor the number of attack variations designed to roll catch a mistaken player. Though this fight does take many many hours to master, it can eventually become one of your most consistent fights as well. We'll look at each of his phase 1 movesets individually, we'll cover general tips for movement and position, emphasize common mistakes, and then study some of his specific attack patterns. With sword phase kicking off the start of every fight, let's cover that one first. It just so happens that this is his most complicated moveset in phase 1 as well. With this in mind, we can get the more difficult stuff out of the way up front. There are two schools of thought when it comes to positioning and dodging Cinder's sword phase combos. The more common one is to position a few feet in front and roll backwards from all initial attacks. Hold back on the left analog stick and react to the next attack. If you've gained proper position on your initial roll, you can jog backward and outspace any backhand follow-ups. React to any other follow-ups by rolling either forward or backward and at a rightward angle. Assuming he follows his combos to the end, roll into the final attack and punish a single time. This strat provides the player with a minimal set of guidelines to follow that allow for a consistent fight. The second school of thought entails rolling the majority of Cinder's attacks forward and to the right. Think 2 o'clock. This method limits some of his combos, particularly the ones that begin with uppercuts, and to a lesser extent those that start with a backhand slash. It can also open up additional punish opportunities over rolling backwards, allowing you to deal with phase 1 more quickly. If you angle your roll slightly inward when dodging an uppercut, you can place yourself in good position for a quick punish. For all other combo attacks, make sure you're clearing him as you roll past. Hold down on your left analog stick, just like you would with the back rolling method, and then close the gap just the same. Both of these methods utilize the concept of staying outside Cinder's attack radius, where the backhand is concerned. Imagine a circle around Cinder representing the reach of both the quick and delayed backhand attacks. With the first roll, the aim is to move from inside the circle to outside the circle. As you move backward, you'll remain outside the circle. You'll then roll back into the circle to punish. If you're still within the circle after the initial roll, the ideal play is to sprint backwards for a brief moment rather than jog. An alternative would be to roll backward again at the first sign of a backhand attack. You'll roll the quick variant on reaction and still outspace the delayed one. The drawback is that you're less likely to bait the final piece of the combo. Another reason to be wary of getting into this habit is the possibility of putting yourself into positions to get roll caught by a thrust attack. If you find yourself struggling with this spacing, it may be a good idea to use the sprint back method by default. Back off and create some distance whenever you need to recover some stamina. Don't ever preemptively roll to create distance during this phase. This goes for either method of fighting Cinder. Simply jog away when needed, and reserve rolls for reacting to his actual attacks. The danger here is getting roll caught, again by a thrust attack in particular. Here are a few rules of thumb regarding punish opportunity. The end of all combos and ordinary single attacks can safely be punished once, following a roll. Any attack where the sword ignites can be punished twice, following a roll. The one hardline exception to this is the running thrust. Any attack that is strafed and isn't part of a combo can safely be punished twice. This includes the fire imbued running poke. However, this is most commonly employed for Cinder's two overhead slash attacks, the standing and running variants. When it comes to double punishes, you'll need to commit promptly. If you find yourself hesitating, you may want to revert to a single punish until you improve your awareness and confidence in the fight. L1-R1 is a viable compromise if you feel on the fence about such an opening. Follow-ups in this fight are typically cancelled if you roll past his hip during the previous attack. This can be used to your advantage to influence which follow-ups you'll get, 
and to pick and choose your punish openings. One notable exception to this is a thrust as the second attack of a combo, which will often come out even if you're past the hip. A good example of picking an opening using this method is how you react to this delayed backhand slash. Here, you have ample time to decide whether you want to roll through it and punish immediately, or back off and bait the third and final piece of the combo. I prefer rolling through, personally. The advantage here is that there's no opportunity lost if the bait fails. Of course, an error in judgment doing this can also mean an unexpected follow-up as you're going for a punish. I'd suggest trying both methods in practice and see which feels best to you. On that note, another thing that seems to influence follow-ups is the direction of your left analog stick relative to Cinder. Holding upward or moving toward Cinder seems to promote follow-up attacks. After outspacing or rolling the second attack of a combo, move back in to bait the third whenever applicable. This is another possible argument for using the sprint back method by default, as doing so will allow you to press up on your left analog sooner. Cinder's sword combos can start one of four ways. A thrust, a front horizontal slash, a backhand slash, or an uppercut. The combos beginning with a thrust are limited to thrust, quick backhand, uppercut, and thrust, delayed backhand, uppercut. Roll or outspace backhand attacks as prescribed, and then bait the third piece. If you opt to roll through the delayed backhand, just remember the rule, pass the hip. Some possible front horizontal combos are slash, backhand, thrust, slash, backhand, uppercut, slash, thrust, slash, backhand, overhead slam, slash, two-handed uppercut, imbued with fire. The backhanded attacks play out exactly the same as they do following a thrust. When the combo begins with a backhand slash, the combos include backhand, thrust, Backhand, overhead slam. Backhand, thrust, overhead slam. Backhand, uppercut, overhead slam. Backhand, uppercut, quick backhand. Rolling at a slight angle for the overhead slam can sometimes save you from an early roll. It does this by positioning you away from the attack. Still, don't slack on spotting the attack and timing properly in practice. And finally, the combos that begin with an uppercut include uppercut, quick backhand, uppercut, overhead slam, uppercut, slash, uppercut, thrust. This is by no means a guaranteed 100% complete list of all of his combos. And the point of mentioning all these combos is not to encourage players to exhaustively memorize every single variation before each run. Instead, it's to help reinforce an idea of typical patterns, and notable exceptions to those patterns. In my opinion, more data is rarely a bad thing. Though the changeup between the quick and delayed backhands should be dealt with by spacing them, it can be helpful to spot the distinction just in case. You can tell one attack apart from the other by watching Cinder's feet. The quick backhand will have Cinder lift his foot before firmly planting it on the ground, then releasing the attack. The delayed backhand will involve smaller, quicker stutter steps by contrast. Reacting to this tell in time may rival Prince's quick slam, but at least your chances go from slim to modest if you know this. In addition to his combos, Cinder has plenty of standalone attacks in sword phase. All of his flaming sword attacks account for most of these. As mentioned earlier, you can punish all of them twice after a roll, except the thrust. This can only safely be punished twice after strafing it. This attack appears mostly when there's some distance between you and Cinder. The flaming uppercut, seen as a follow-up earlier, can also appear on its own. When it appears on its own, Cinder can repeat it twice in a row, or up to three times total. Positioning is primarily what determines if he'll repeat this attack. As with the other attacks, pass the hip will ensure he does not repeat it. 
Pause for a moment if you're unsure of your position after dodging it. This might reduce your punish opportunity, but will keep the run alive. Often, a brief enough pause will still leave plenty of opening for an L1-R1. One unique standalone attack is this large circular slash with fire imbued sword. At first, it looks similar to the fire charged thrust attack. Instead, he'll pause briefly, slowly rotate, and then unleash a heavy slash after a substantial delay. In addition to the two punish you can tack on the backside, you can pre punish this attack as well. Do this only when you get a good read on the attack and are confident in your timing. To this day, I still misread the startup once in a while and roll for the fire charge thrust. If you do this, you won't want to try and pre-punish. All in all, that makes this attack the one triple punish in phase one outside of staggers. These two overhead slams also appear as solo attacks. One is a standing attack with a long windup. The other involves a running start, which ends with Cinder sort of hopping and then slamming. One obvious tell for this attack is the jump back, which will always precede the attack when up close. Given more space, Cinder can skip this animation. You can roll either attack and punish once, but the tracking on both attacks is fairly poor. I'd encourage you to get comfortable strafing both of these attacks if you can. This will double your punish opportunity with both attacks, and can be achieved locked on nearly as well as unlocked. Prompt recognition is the real key here, and to a lesser extent, spacing. The final set of standalone attacks appear as attempts to punish the player for being at Cinder's side. There are two versions of this when the player is off to his right, and another version when off to his left. Both are fairly telegraphed and offer a single punish opportunity following a roll. There are a handful of additional strafes in sword phase that are reliable under the right circumstances. The majority of these are thrust attacks, both ordinary and fire charged. You can dodge thrusts as the initial piece of a combo by merely stepping to the right, so long as you're within a few feet of cinder. You can do the same for thrusts that follow a front horizontal slash or an uppercut. In these two cases though, you may want to sprint briefly to account for proximity. The situation where you never want to strafe a thrust attack is when it follows a backhand. This can either be the second piece of a combo, with the backhand as the leading attack, or any combo that ends with a thrust. When strafing the fire charged two-hand thrust, reasonably close distance is key as well. From an optimal spot, you should be able to get by with jogging right and not even unlocking. Unlocking and or sprinting is typically a good idea though. Admittedly, this is a harder one to consistently pull off than the ordinary thrust. In a live run, I typically only do this when it's the opening attack of the fight. The reason for this is that I'm already sprinting towards Cinder, and this gives better position. When doing this with the opener, be wary of the camera and lock-on. I've had situations where a change in camera orientation caused me to run back into the attack. Lastly, you can strafe this fire-charged two-handed slash. You need to start sprinting around his right side by the time his slow rotation begins. Be extremely careful of elevation when attempting this, as it can completely screw you over if you end up far enough above him. I don't ever punish this way myself. You lose the ability to pre-punish and don't gain a safe extra L1 on the back end or anything. At best, you maybe conserve a marginal amount of stamina over rolling and punishing the two L1s, and gain some time to reposition afterward. A handful of runners like to do this though. Using all available techniques, including strafes and different roll schemes, you could even mix and match to create a more adaptive playstyle. For example, you could hug Cinder and sidestep all the initial thrust attacks, then sprint back right and roll in to the third attack and punish. For front horizontal combos, roll and sprint backwards and repeat. And for uppercut and backhand leading combos, roll forward and to the right, canceling most of the follow-ups in these sets entirely. Sorcery is often a runner's favorite phase, as it's pretty simple to deal with in its own right. 
There are five moves which Cinder has in this phase. Soul Spear, Farron Hail, Flash Sword, Crystal Soul Mass, and Soul Stream. The key is to not early roll or panic roll anything, especially if Soul Mass is in play. In fact, you should avoid rolling for Soul Mass as often as possible and instead jog to the side of it. This will leave you free to roll his other attacks. For all other attacks, I like to roll up and to the right, just like Sword Phase. You can punish any of these attacks twice, except Soul Spear. Just mind your stamina. Sometimes he can hop backward before the second attack lands. This is unfortunate, but at least it's not dangerous. It's a good idea to line things up so that he staggers during Soul Mass. This will rid him of the spell and help prevent him from going into another phase with Soul Mass active. If you landed some intermittent hits in Sword Phase, but haven't procced a stagger, it might be best to stick to single punishes. This should help prevent staggering him before he casts Soul Mass. There is no hard and fast rule here, outside of counting hits. It will simply take some judgment and experience to get a feel for how close you are to landing the stagger. Particularly in an SL1 run, staggering him too early in Sorcery Phase opens up the possibility for him to cast Soul Mass again. If he's in a particularly vengeful mood, he'll then immediately swap to another weapon. Conversely, this is a non-issue altogether with an aggressive enough Twin Blades fight. The individual Soul Masses will not fire backward. In theory, this makes it safe to attack while he's facing away from you. However, he'll often turn to face you rather quickly, unleashing one or two of these projectiles during your attack recovery. The one practical usage here is during Soul Stream. When casting Soul Stream, his turn rate will be severely limited, allowing you the opportunity for two, three, even four L1s. Stand behind Cinder's leg and face toward his back. Dead angle and use the attack's momentum to match his rotation, keeping you safely behind him during the attack. With Twin Blades, it may be best to take the first two L1s during the windup. Back up, adjust, then take two more. If you haven't staggered him yet, this could provide an excellent opportunity to do so. The strategy is the same even with Soul Mass not in play. The only difference here is that there are fewer things to worry about. The projectiles won't fire for the first couple seconds after they appear. If you attack as they're appearing, don't panic. Just move back a few feet after landing your attack and strafe to the side as you normally would. Some players prefer to trigger all the projectiles each cycle before going in for an attack. You can do this by moving across the front of Cinder and then strafing back in your original direction as the projectiles fire. If Cinder uses Flash Sword, his body will turn in a manner that causes most, if not all of these masses, from his far shoulder to fire. This provides a nice alternative to getting rid of these, but will only work as often as RNG permits. You can also ignore the masses on his opposite shoulder in every other situation and just mind your positioning. Spear Phase is a mixed bag among runners. Some love it, and some hate it. If you play the fight at close distance, it will keep you on your toes, but does provide ample punish opportunity. You can also choose to play this phase at range. This makes it a little easier and still offers okay punish opportunity, depending on how you dodge each attack. The attacks you can most often expect to see at close range are a quick one-handed poke, a backhand slash, a standing two-handed thrust, a double spin, Wrath of the Gods, and an impaling grab attack. Starting with the quick poke attack, dodge this forward and to the right just as you would with sword phase attacks. He'll often perform this attack several times in a row. Don't try to punish this attack after a roll. However, if you manage to plant yourself all the way toward his left shoulder, you can hug his side and strafe subsequent pokes. This will open up the opportunity for a single punish each time. Once you've attacked, you'll need to roll the next poke to get back into position at his side. Be careful of moving too far past him, as he can rotate the other direction. This will place you in front of him again, often slightly toward his right side. Cinder's backhand attack occurs when you're in front of him, usually rotating to the right, and also seems to occur frequently after attacking him. 
It's one of the quickest attacks to read in a run like this, and likely a good chunk of the reason many prefer to fight this moveset at range. If you're looking to maintain close positioning, you'll want to roll this the same way as the poke. It never really presents any punish opportunity, and is kind of just a waste of time until he does another attack. If you're playing a more in-and-out strategy, you won't have to deal with this attack nearly as often. Keep away from the left hip when you do go in for a punish, and you'll keep this to a minimum. The two-handed thrust begins with a fairly long wind-up. He'll plant his left foot forward, head and spear both tilted downward. You can punish this attack once after rolling, or twice after strafing. The tracking on this attack is pretty weak. If you're near his side when you spot the wind-up, you won't need to move much to pull this off. Even if you're mostly in front of him, you can quickly sprint to his side to avoid the attack. Just make sure you can both spot it and react to it promptly. There are two methods to dealing with the double spin. Which you choose to implement should depend partly on range. The first is backing out of range of the first spin and then rolling through the second. The other method is to time your roll in order to iframe the first spin and then land beyond the range of the second. You want to position in front and slightly to the right of him. Roll tightly past his shoulder. Use the first method only if you have the time and space to back out for it. Utilize the second method only from close range. If you're at a relative mid-range, quickly adjust your position and use whichever method's more comfortable. Both methods provide opportunity for a single punish. The best course of action for Wrath of the Gods is to roll away. Just take care not to roll too early. You'll likely encounter a number of scenarios where you can outspace this attack. Judge wisely and remember, better safe than sorry. He'll commonly follow up either by trying to heal or queuing the double spin. It's worth noting that the HP regen can be cancelled by throwing a dual charm at Cinder. I wouldn't really worry about this outside of low damage runs. The Impaling Grab Attack is the only attack in this moveset for which the weapon will ignite. It can also be distinguished from the Standing Thrust by observing that he switches his stance, now holding the spear along his left side during the windup. This attack will roll catch if you dodge away in panic, unaware of what's happening. At least it looks kinda badass though. This attack leaves ample room for two L1s. At distance, you can expect to see three additional attacks, a running one-handed poke, a lunging thrust, and the sort of jousting attack. The running poke is similar to the standing variant, except that he'll sprint toward you first. This makes it slightly more telegraphed. Handle this attack the same way you would the standing poke. The lunging thrust has a delayed wind-up similar to the standing thrust. The differences to look for are the distance the weapon is pulled back and cinder stance. The spear is pulled back much further for this attack, and there is little to no downward head tilt. Depending on your position, rolling somewhere between forward right 1 o'clock and back right 5 o'clock are good options. Forward right tends to be a better bet purely in terms of safety. However, this can put you really far from Cinder following the dodge. If you're playing this phase at range anyway, this isn't necessarily a major issue. If you're trying to stay close, or at least close in here and there for a couple attacks, this isn't ideal. Rolling back into the right with the attack can put you in optimal position for a follow-on punish. This method takes more practice and isn't necessarily the safest thing to do. However, if you're using Blood Ring, the dodge is still fairly lenient. Rolling back into the left is a little safer and offers the same punish. You may want to rotate back to the right side after you attack if you're playing up close. A third option is to back off a bit and roll to the left. The final attack in this moveset is the Joust. He'll hold the spear out in front of him, run several paces in a straight line, and then thrust. My preferred method for dealing with this attack is to jog backward and then roll directly to the right. Roll timing for this attack should be adjusted based on proximity. If you're closer to Cinder during the start of the attack, it's best to roll a little earlier. Fortunately, the tracking is quite poor, so rolling well before the thrust is fine, provided you move sufficiently to the side. You can then take one to two steps forward and have time for a single L1. 
Just like the lunging thrust, you can evade this attack to the left, if you prefer. The most common tactic against Pyro Curved Sword is to run. It's best to do so in a medium-sized arc, as demonstrated here. Be mindful of the stumps throughout the arena, and try to avoid getting caught on any at an inopportune time. One option for avoiding this is to stay entirely in the center portion of the arena, between all the adjacent stumps. Doing so actually synergizes quite well with the optimum arc size. If executed well, you can outrun most attacks without needing to roll. Technically, you can outrun all of them, but there are a few I'd recommend rolling just in case. This is Cinder's most expansive Phase 1 moveset outside of Straight Sword. All of his melee attacks are characteristic of a typical Curved Sword moveset usable by the player character. He utilizes four pyromancies as well, Combustion, Fireball, Poison Mist, and Power Within. He'll sometimes combine these, such as executing a Quick Slash, followed by Combustion. Despite the popularity of Retreat, there are actually a handful of punish opportunities in this phase. The simplest, and one I'd imagine most people take, is Power Within. Prior to casting, he'll usually backflip twice. Depending on your proximity, you can safely land either one or two L1s. He'll commonly respond with his twirling attack or combustion, both of which can be outspaced with a preemptive roll. Another viable punish is the Fireball. Obviously, you'll want to start closing in as soon as you spot the windup and roll through the attack. Punish once, and then back out. Be prepared to respond to whatever he does next. I tend to avoid this punish personally due to the number of variables and relatively short window compared to Power Within. However, it is manageable if it suits your playstyle. A handful of melee attacks can be punished as well. The easiest of these is likely the Fire Imbued Double Spin attack. I like to roll the first attack directly backward and the second one up and to the left. The goal is to land the second roll to his right with a couple feet of space. Land a single L1 and then back out. Beware that he can sidestep after this attack and that this motion can stagger the player. Avoid this by keeping away from his back and direct sides following the punish. This is one of the very few attacks where I actually recommend a rolling attack over a standing one. He usually precedes this attack with a roll, but if you're close enough, he'll sometimes do this from a standing posture. You can prevent it by overrunning each of his attacks for an additional second or two before stopping to regain stamina. Another attack that can be punished is this Lunging Slash, which comes in two variants, Forward and Backhand. The best way to punish either version of this attack is to outspace it, and then time an L1 right as he finishes the swing. Back off after landing your punish. He'll commonly follow this attack with Combustion. The last thing to call attention to in this phase is that he can parry you during a Stagger Recovery. To prevent this, don't overpunish if you manage to stagger him in this phase. Take no more than one or two L1s depending on proximity. If you'd like to sneak in a little more damage, you can punish once more with an unparryable attack. The spin slash weapon art of the Twin Blades is one such example. The stomp weapon art, two-handed ultra greatsword and great hammer attacks, and jumping attacks are others. Unfortunately, these other examples present no real use in most runs. One of the most nerve-wracking scenarios a player can encounter is Soul Mass on top of other phases. Whenever Soul Mass is in play, it can and will carry over to his next moveset. This can happen if you don't stagger him out of it during Sorcery phase, often if you're not aggressive enough with your punish. In rare situations though, he can just cast it at the end of the phase and immediately swap. Soul Mass on other movesets obviously presents an added danger to the fight. Aside from dealing with both the projectiles and overlapping melee attacks, there will be few, if any, opportunities to attack. Perhaps the most concerning element, though, is the fact that it's hard to practice for these specific situations. With a level head, patience, and a little know-how, soul mass on top of any other moveset is perfectly survivable, though. The most straightforward of these, in my opinion, is soul mass on top of Pyro Curved Sword. Since you can outrun the vast majority of this moveset anyway, it's not much different than dealing with it under normal conditions. 
One thing I would suggest is timing stamina recovery between moments where soul mass is likely or inevitably going to fire. You may want to tighten your arc as well whenever soul masses are about to fire. Keep in mind this will position you a bit closer to cinder as you move around. Keep a sharp eye out for any attacks that might overlap the projectiles, and roll along your adjusted arc to be safe. Be extra mindful of stamina as well. The next most difficult is soul mass on top of spear phase. My advice is generally the same as with curved sword. Give chase in a wide arc and manage stamina carefully. I like to go counterclockwise for this scenario, but clockwise is fine too. Two attacks to watch out for in particular are the lunging thrust and the jousting attack. As you roll for either attack, the projectiles will often fire as you and Cinder cross paths. This will cause situations in which they fire to the side and sort of behind him. You'll need to adjust direction on the fly to avoid being caught by these, which can be complicated slightly by the camera. An alternative is to sprint directly away and then cut left for each attack, utilizing rolls sparingly. This might be a bit easier to execute if you're moving clockwise already. If he happens to somehow cue a close-ranged attack, treat it like you would attacks in sorcery phase. By far the worst phase to see soul mass spill over to is straight sword. This is partly due to how demanding sword phase is on stamina, and partly to all the change-ups involved, along with trying to focus on the projectiles as well. You'll need to avoid rolling and sprinting directly backward at all now, which may complicate your spacing as well. Instead, aim for more lateral rolling mixed with sprinting and even rolling away from all follow-up attacks. Try to focus on where your normal punish windows would be and use these to regain stamina, jogging at an angle from soul mass as needed. While you're looping Cinder, ease on and off the gas. This might not keep him chasing as long between attacks, but will ensure you don't completely run out of stamina. Phase 2 will trigger once Cinder's been reduced to about 2% health or lower. The phase will always begin with Cinder slowly standing back up, switching to a great sword, and then thrusting it into the ground, resulting in a modest AoE. The typical method of dealing with this attack is to hang back and wait for the next scripted attack, the two-handed jump. Roll into him and take up to two L1s. Back out and wait for his flurry combo to conclude. Once it has, close back in but do not immediately attack. While Cinder typically idles for a few seconds at the end of this combo, 1 in 20 times he doesn't. If you happen to be mid-punish, this can end your run right at the finish line. You can skip the jump follow-up by standing outside the range of the AoE and running in directly after a brief pause. Attack Cinder with a running L1 and one follow-on L1. If you're quick, two standing L1s and an R1 is manageable. An alternative option is to stand back a bit and roll through the AoE. This AoE is smaller than it looks. If you want something to base your distance off of rather than visual judgment, Two back steps from this distance should space you properly. You can comfortably fit three L1s after closing in. If you're confident in your spacing and timing, three L1s and an R1 will work as well. Even four L1s is doable. However, I would only attempt this if you're wearing Blood Ring and can afford to roll the AoE a couple frames early. If you're taking any punish beyond three L1s, I'd recommend having around 30 or more endurance. Briefly sprint out, then recoup enough stamina to roll backward twice. The roll timing itself is a bit later than you might expect. Wait until the sword is fully plunged and roll through just as the shock wave of fire is appearing. Here are a couple clips in slow motion. Again, if you're wearing Blood Ring, you can roll slightly earlier and even use this to your advantage to close the gap sooner. However, I would get familiar with the normal timing as well, even if you plan to use this. Buffing with a resin before the opening AoE or toward the end of the combo are both decent options. You can also opt to buff with a bundle before the AoE, and then a resin as he finishes the combo. If you're rolling into the AoE for extra punish, you can even eat a blossom and then bundle or resin prior to the opening AoE. You can then proceed to carry a resin or buff with one after you've punished with a bundle. 
Getting some extra punish in during transition could lead to an early stagger in phase two. For hitless, I wouldn't bank on this, but it is nice when it happens. Phase two is generally easier than phase one, but still nothing to take lightly. Breathe easy, knowing there are fewer moves to learn, but stay on your toes, knowing it's still conceivable to slip up here. The two most viable ways to play phase two are up close, chest to chest, and at mid-range. We'll start with mid-range, as it's generally considered the safer, more popular option. From this position, you can expect a couple jump attacks, a running thrust, and lightning spear. One of the jump attacks is a two-handed variant. This can be comfortably punished by rolling directly into Cinder, attacking once, and then backing out. He may follow up with a one- or two-handed slash, which you can simply roll away from. Depending on how long it's been, he'll commonly go back into the flurry as well. The other jump attack is a one-handed variant. He may follow up with either a two-handed thrust or a delayed overhead slash. If he goes for one of these, strafe around his left side and punish like so. Be careful not to hug him too closely, as both attacks have hitboxes that exceed the actual width of the sword. You can fit an L1 after the thrust, and an L1 R1, or two L1s after the overhead, if you swing early enough. If he does not follow up the one-handed jump, do not punish. Back out and prepare for the next attack. This is often the running thrust, which can be awkward to deal with after a jump. It's awkward due to the fact that it can put you out to the left of Cinder as he turns, right in the path of this atrocity of a hitbox. The running thrust should be dodged to the right. Whether you dodge forward right, backward right, or directly to the side should depend on your position and whether or not you plan to punish this attack. Dodging either past him or slightly away from him is a good option if you plan to back off from this attack, while dodging in close to him is ideal if you're looking to punish. This attack can even be sidestepped as well. You can squeeze in a single L1 after the thrust. He'll then follow up with one of two attacks. The first is a backhanded slash, and the second is a two-handed horizontal slash. The two-handed attack is much slower, so take care to distinguish the timing between these two follow-ups. It's a good idea to have these dodge timings down, even if you're backing off from this attack. You can usually sprint away after the first dodge though, or roll for spacing if you're not right against him. Be wary about using rolls to create space for most other situations. Lightning Spear provides a comfortable punish opportunity if you can close the gap. Land a single L1 and then back off. If you're on level ground or facing uphill, you can safely stand underneath it as well and the bolt will go over to your head. Needless to say, you'll only want to attempt this if you're relatively close when the attack begins. If you're using the Twin Blades or any other weapon with a vertical attack, you'll also want to avoid swinging right as he throws the bolt. This can result in the bolt colliding with your character's arm, and thus a hit. Next, we'll take a look at all his close-ranged Phase 2 attacks. It's important to at least spot these consistently and understand proper evasion. Even if you don't plan on fighting Phase 2 up close, you'll still see some of these after punishing long-ranged attacks, and rarely if he jogs up to you. His close-ranged attacks consist primarily of one-handed and two-handed slashes, which he'll chain into various combos. Both sets consist of two-piece and three-piece combos. The three-piece combos, starting with a one-handed slash, have both quicker initial attacks and quicker follow-ups than the two-handed variations. What will differ in these combos is the third and final swing. One variation will consist of a third diagonal slash from the left. In the other variation, the final slash involves a longer delay and this spinning motion. If you're playing the fight primarily from mid-range, you'll likely never see the final piece of these combos. If you're fighting up close, you'll need to distinguish these tells promptly. You'll need to have both delays committed to muscle memory as well. The combos starting with a two-handed slash have a slower initial attack and follow-up compared to the one-handed variations. The first attack will come from the left, then the follow-up from the right, in a more horizontal fashion than the one-handed slashes. Common third-piece follow-ups are an overhead slash and this underhanded sweep. 
Similar to the straight sword combos in phase 1, moving far enough past his side will usually prevent the final piece of this combo. Be wary of this when choosing whether or not to go for a punish from this position. He could combo either a one-handed or two-handed slash into an overhead slam, and a two-handed slash into a two-handed thrust. A one-handed slash can also chain into a two-handed slash and end in a three-piece. At close range, Cinder will also utilize a lightning stake attack. You can either jog backward and roll away from this, or roll through it and punish once. He can follow up with an overhead slam or the underhanded sweep attack. If he performs this follow-up, you can attack with a standing L1 or simply back out, depending on your preference. When I first began adjusting to this punish, I'd even attack with a rolling R1. Another thing Cinder can perform at close range is the grab. If you're moving backward, you may be able to outspace this. At a full body length or more, you can simply jog backwards and begin attacking right as he swipes. If you're a little closer, you can sprint backwards to create more range. If you can outspace this attack, you can safely take two L1s. Otherwise, roll the attack and punish once. Be on the lookout for Cinder to kick from close range as well. This comes out fairly quick, but a little anticipation goes a long way. When practicing Cinder, focus on all the times where the kick could occur and come to expect it in runs. The only tricky situation you might find yourself in, beyond this, is getting a kick when you're off to Cinder's side. The issue here is visibility. The tell will be harder to read due to both obstruction from Cinder's left side, and in particularly bad cases, the player getting between Cinder and the camera. The kick will commonly be followed with a grab. A kick can even be followed with another kick. Below about 75% HP, Cinder will gain his lightning rain attack. This will be telegraphed by a backstep preceding the attack. This attack is a great opportunity for a double, even triple punish if you respond promptly. There are a few methods for dealing with this attack following the punish. The first is to back out to about this range shown here. Begin moving sideways just before the lightning rains down and roll directly to the side once or twice to evade the bolts. Try to avoid running downhill when using this method. Running downhill increases the likelihood of a bolt coming straight at you from the side. Instead, aim for flat ground or even uphill. The second method is to stand a little closer, roughly underneath where the bolts spawn. Take a couple steps forward after the crackle of thunder and roll forward or backward once. The bolts will converge onto a small area, mitigating the likelihood of stray bolts. The third method is to move really far away and then side sprint the bolts as they fire. This method also causes the bolts to converge, only it focuses them horizontally rather than vertically. This is the de facto strat for no roll cinder kills. The main disadvantage is that this limits your punish on the front end since you'll need more time to cover the distance. The final method is to rotate behind cinder. Just after you hear the distant thunder, begin jogging backwards and respond only to Cinder's next attack. This method deals with a situation that should never really happen, but occasionally does. During this attack, Cinder should simply idle backwards. However, sometimes he attacks in the middle of lightning rain. It's rare, but handling the attack this way will guarantee a follow-up from Cinder in a way that allows the player to consistently dodge both. Take care not to start backing off too early. The goal here is to bait a close-ranged attack and to avoid jumps and running thrusts. This method becomes increasingly advantageous in lower damage runs. At enough distance, the previous method of side sprinting can also provide some insurance from an attack during lightning rain. When it comes to twin blade builds, there's not much to differentiate. There are no real damage setups in this fight, or alternate strategies based on loadout. Just stack whatever damage rings you have, and cart this blood ring if you have it. If you're playing a fairly aggressive Cinder, I would strongly encourage Chloranthy Ring if available. In runs that include DLC, I'll typically grab Chloranthy plus 3 before this fight. 
The difference between the plus three ring and the base ring, or no ring at all, is rather remarkable. I like to pop a blossom at the start of the fight as well for that additional boost. Pontiff's right eye can be helpful, especially when punishing staggers. However, if you have to pick between the two, I'd prioritize stamina regen. As far as buffs are concerned, dark and lightning are the best options, with lightning narrowly taking the crown. I like to have 30 endurance for this boss, and roughly 50 dex. Some players opt for less endurance and more dex, but the damage increase between 50 and 60 dex is fairly negligible. Endurance, on the other hand, can make a difference, depending on player strats and aggression. Your exact stats don't fundamentally change the fight though, so use whatever is comfortable. Cinder is a boss that punishes the player for playing too passively. It may seem that the slower and steadier you play, the safer you are, but that is not really the case in this fight. That's not to say you shouldn't pick and choose your openings in a manner that's consistent with your comfort level. However, if you're regularly seeing soul mass on other phases or fights with multiple heals, you're going to want to spend more time in practice working on aggression. These should be rare occurrences in a level twin blade run, regardless of RNG. If you can comfortably reduce Cinder to half health most sword cycles, and pick at least a couple attacks to punish in spear phase, I'd say you're on the right track. Spear is understandably concerning for many players, but not punishing it at all is very limiting, and can greatly increase the length and risk of the fight. It's outside of the meta runs where the loadout options become more interesting. For SL1, the most common tactic is to use Raw Broadsword. This offers respectable DPS and is probably the most straightforward to use, offering similar punish windows to Twin Blades. Perhaps the biggest drawback to Broadsword, though, is the lack of stagger buildup. Either the club or reinforced club are decent backup options. The DPS isn't quite as good, but the stagger is much better. This might be worth trying if you're playing an SL1 run and struggling with soul mass on other movesets. Cinder isn't the most susceptible to bleed, but you might get a couple procs with the reinforced club. Another option is using a great sword, like the Black Knight sword. This will present exceptional stagger. One drawback is that it will require you to adapt to a different punish scheme. Normal L1 punishes are a bit tighter. For openings that are normally double punish, you'll instead want to attack with an R2. In particularly long openings like Soul Stream and during some staggers, charged R2s are a viable option. The biggest drawback is that it will tie up three of your ring slots just to use it. If you're open to spell usage, Great Combustion is perhaps the best low-level, no-upgrade choice for Phase 2. It offers comparable damage to Black Knight Sword, with less stamina cost and a quicker rate of attack. You'll lose stagger, but that's not a big deal in Phase 2. Pair this build with Saint's Tree Belvine in the offhand for maximum efficacy. And last but not least, the dagger is an unsung hero in many ways, even at SL1. You want to utilize quick steps and play a bit more aggressively to capitalize on this. Just be careful of the quick step range, particularly in sword phase. For situations where you want to dodge past Cinder for a punish, it may be best to roll as normal. With Dagger, you can sneak hits in between combos. This is especially the case in Phase 2. Ironically, Sharp Infusion is better for the Dagger than Raw, even at SL1. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Feel free to leave feedback below or via Discord, and good luck on your runs.